But one particular problem with biostratigraphy is that you have a lot of species. So what Charles Lyell did was to basically just look at the percentage of fossils that are similar or different from modern fossils. That's fine, but it's somewhat limited in scope because the fossil record is much richer than just looking at percentages of modern versus ancient uh, species. But the challenge is that there are so many species that you don't really know which one to use. So one technique to circumvent this problem is to use graphic correlation. Graphic correlation is a fairly simple concept. The idea is that you take one section and its fossil assemblages, you take the other section and its fossil assemblages, and you plot each section against each other in terms of the meters at which the different events occur. And then you see whether or not you observe some predictable trends in those fossils. So typically, you will take your first section, known as the reference section, as the one that is thickest, so where you have the most sediment, and by extension, hopefully the most complete. Then you plot the range of those fossils that you have versus depth, and you select your second section, and you also plot the range of those fossils versus depth. And then the, the graphic correlation comes when you plot one section against the other section. And normally, if you have constant sedimentation rates and you have both sections that are complete, what you should see is a nice correlation line. Even if the sedimentation rates at both sections are different, because the succession of these different fossils should be predictable, you should see a nice correlation line. Now, not all data points might be useful. You might have some species that are endemic or some species that just, you know, appear in one section, but you never recover in the other section. So you might actually have data point that falls away from this line of correlation. And if that's the case, you can get rid of those data points. And that's one way that graphic correlation can help you because it helps you filter fossils that are not so useful for at least regional correlations. The other thing that's extremely useful with this uh, technique is that you can compare sedimentation rates. Even without knowing the age of the fossils, assuming that they should appear and disappear at the same time in both locations, you can determine whether you have sedimentation rates that are equal, so the line of correlation is effectively plotting at 45 degrees, or maybe if you have change in sedimentation rates. So in this case here, you would see that we have equal sedimentation rates up to that kink. And then at that point, you can see that accumulation in section A is much faster than in section B, meaning that there is, that there is a, a ratio of sedimentation rates between section A and B that is greater than one because section A has more sediments. So that could mean either you increase sedimentation rates in section A or you decrease sedimentation rates in section B at that point, or perhaps a combination of both. And in the example C here, you can see the reverse, where essentially the ratio of sedimentation rate in section A versus B is decreasing. And there's also a case, the possibility, that you might actually have a hiatus in one of the two sections. So in this case, you see in example D that we have an increase uh, in sedimentation at both section. But then interestingly, as we accumulate sediment at section B, we accumulate no sediment at section A. In other words, we have a hiatus in section A before we resume normal sedimentation. So graphic correlation is a powerful tool and you can use it with almost no knowledge of biostratigraphy. All you have to do is assume that the species that you pick are good markers, i.e. that they appear and disappear at the same time in the two basins or the two locations that you selected. And that's a very useful tool that everybody can use. But it's not the most refined tool for biostratigraphy. The concept that is key for the modern application of biostratigraphy came from a French scientist, Dorbigny, who invented the idea of a stage. Now, a stage is essentially a collection of key index fossils that usually appear together and that are characteristic of a given age. 
And that is really, really important because those stages completely free up your biostratigraphy from lithostratigraphy. There is absolutely no tie between a stage and the rocks in which those stages are being deposited because the stage himself is, is defined by an assemblage that is of key species. And that's a major difference from what Charles Lyles had done. Charles Lyles mostly looked at mollusks and mollusks, we will see, can be endemic. So Dorbini invented that concept of stage in the 19th century and a German scientist, a German stratigrapher, Opel, um, improved on that concept. And now we have this important concept of using stages. So how do we define a stage or a biozone, as um, Opel called them? Well, the first thing to realize is that these are units of convenience. They are defined so that they're small enough to be usable for refined biostratigraphy and large enough that you can actually recognize. And also they're based on index fossils that should be found everywhere, ideally, in, in every ocean basin of the world. And there are different ways of defining a biozone. So let's start with the most simple biozone, the one you've seen when we did the graphic correlation exercise. So that's known as the total range zone. If you have one fossil that appears at some point and disappears at some point, and that this appearance is global in every basin of the world and the disappearance is also global, you can use its total range. You can also use consecutive range biozone. Imagine that you have a species that evolves. So you start with a certain form of a species, then you have a speciation event where the species changes, and then a second speciation event where it changes again. And you can use those different consecutive um, events to define the biozone. You can also have a partial range biozone. Now a partial range biozone is when you have one index species that basically straddles several biozones, but it is sometimes found with one key species that disappears at some point, then it's found on its own, and then it's found again with another different key species. And that's the partial biozone. It's when this particular species is present on its own and with the absence of the two other key species. And that can be a very good time marker. Perhaps the most common biozone used today is the assemblage biozone. And the assemblage biozone is when you use several species together that are characteristic of a given time interval. And finally, there's also a biozone known as the ACME biozone. That's when you look at one particular fossil. Now this fossil neither appear nor disappear. However, at some point it becomes very abundant. It forms most of the assemblage and that's an ACME in the number of that particular species. And you can, you can trace this in the ocean and use this as a, an ACME biozone. That's also a useful biozone for dating.